Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great session in our first series of American English Live Teacher Development here on the American English for Educators Facebook page. My name is Moderator Kate, and as many of you know, I'll be with you behind the scenes today. And along with me today are my colleagues, Moderator Lauren and Moderator Heather, who will be here to help answer any questions you may have. Today, our host, John Mark King, will be talking with Regional English Language Officer Kevin McCoy about movement in the classroom. So we hope you're excited and ready to be inspired by a lot of great tips and tricks for your classroom. So let's go ahead and get started by welcoming our host, John Mark King. Welcome, John Mark. Hi, Kate. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I, I have to tell you, I am really, really excited about today's session. Um, I'm really looking forward to what Kevin has to share. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great session. Yeah. Well, welcome, everybody, to the fourth session of our exciting new series, American English Live Teacher Development. Just to let you know, our sessions are, are every other Wednesday at 8 a.m. and at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, broadcast from right here in Washington, D.C. It's wonderful to see you here again. And if you are here for the first time, Welcome. We're glad that you're with us. My name is John Mark King. I work here in Washington at the Office of English Language Programs, and I'm part of the American English social media team. I'm super happy to be your facilitator and your host today. I have to tell you, we love to see teachers learning and exchanging ideas. We're teachers ourselves, so it's really wonderful. So we want to send a, send a very special thank you to Gabriela Tarututie, and the viewing group from the American Corner in Xiaoliai County Povilas Vyshinsky's Public Library in Lithuania. Wow, I hope I got at least one of those words right. Thank you for submitting this photo of them participating in our second session this series. We wanna see more photos. So please share yours by emailing them to the email address on the screen, American English Webinars, at elprograms.org. You send it to us, there's a very good chance that we'll feature it right here at this point in the next session. All right, let's take a look now at this series schedule. We're about halfway through the first series of American English Live, and it's going really, really well so far. We're having a lot of fun. You can see we've had some presenters and topics already, and we still have a few more left to go. This month, we're focusing on getting students moving and getting them active in the English language classroom. We look forward to seeing you for all of our sessions though, which just as a reminder, 8 a.m., 1 p.m. Eastern time from Washington, D.C. and they're broadcast right here on the American English for Educators Facebook page. A little bit about our sessions and what you can expect. They're each about 60 minutes long and you'll be able to respond to the presenter's questions in the comment box below. So occasionally Kevin and I will ask questions of you and we want to, to hear your comments and then we uh, will even talk about a few of them during the session. Um, each of our sessions is related to a theme found on the American English website or as part of an exciting new American English e-teacher massive open online course or MOOC. The Teacher's Corner section from the website shown here features resources and lesson ideas that are related to this month's topic. In this month's Teacher's Corner, just like our topic for the month in these um, online events, we examine movement in the classroom. We also want to say that the latest issue of English Teaching Forum is now available online at AmericanEnglish.state.gov, and of course it's 100% free. This is our academic journal for English teachers worldwide. This month is featured an article on movement in the classroom by Regional English Language Officer Kevin McCoy, who will be discussing this very topic with me today. Also, you'll learn creative ways to use music and songs, and to get tips for supporting out-of-class reading, plus a whole lot more. So, as many of you know, because you've done this before, today you're going to have the opportunity to earn a digital badge or an electronic certificate from our team here at American English for Educators. 
So pay close attention because at the end of the session today, we're going to give you a link to complete a very short quiz to receive this badge. So what you have to do is answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly and also respond to one short answer question. But you can only enter your information one time. So please take your time, make sure that you read each question carefully. After that, expect your badge by email in within about a week. So finally, today's event. Keep it moving. Ideas for fun, active classroom activities. During the session today, Regional English Language Officer Kevin McCoy is going to share his approach to a dynamic classroom space he calls the movable class. Kevin's going to share how this approach will help you to use more group work, design student-centered activities, and become, in general, a more confident classroom manager, all while you and your students have more fun. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Kevin McCoy. Kevin is a regional English language officer currently based in Pretoria, South Africa, and he's a regular contributor to the American English webinar series. He's offered teacher training workshops and presented at conferences in 30 countries. In his 20s, he played in rock bands, so I think he knows the importance of a good presentation. Kevin, welcome. It's great to have you. <laughs> I'm moving. Well done. <laughs> I'm moving. How are you? I'm doing great. Great to see you, John Mark. Team in Washington. And welcome uh, teachers from around the world to our Live American English on Facebook. That's right. We're super happy to have you, Kevin. Thanks so much for speaking with us today. Um, it's my pleasure. I love to keep it moving. So I hope that teachers out there will enjoy these ideas for a fun, active classroom. I've been getting some great feedback on this topic, and it can be quite a challenge in many environments around the world to incorporate movement into education. And then there's the whole question, John Mark, probably the biggest one, why would you do that? Yeah, why, why would you do that? What's the point? Are you gonna make me answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, you are the, you are the presenter today, so I'm, I'm assuming that uh, you, have, you have an idea of what to say. <laughs> I do, and I think we're going to see some great justification in the next hour for incorporating movement into the classroom. Let's move on a little bit. And that is I right there. You can see that I like jumping. I like movement. Um, I'm at the Regional English Language Office in Southern Africa. So it's great to be coming to you live today. About a week ago, I was driving just outside of my city, and I saw these three little guys, cheetahs. So that's cheetah cubs. Oh, you were driving? Oh. I, I hoped your windows weren't rolled down. They're, they're <laughs> they, dangerous. Yeah, these guys were not too dangerous. You can see it's, it's very close to a city. It's in a park. Uh, but we were very lucky to see these guys, and they were out playing because that's how young cheetahs learn to hunt. They learn by moving. So let's move ahead. And I thought that was a little bit connected to our message, learning and movement. So today we're going to see how we can get more movement into the classroom with really easy ideas. And then that question we talked about, John Mark, why should you do it? And then we're going to explore how to make the environment more movement friendly. Sounds great. Yeah, okay, so let's take a look. And I think that we often associate movement in the classroom with kids, kids playing, because they need that to focus. They can't focus, they can't concentrate very long but I'm I contend that all ages can benefit from movement and you're gonna see pictures in this webinar of teachers having a great time moving 
So let's ask, let's ask the audience, John Mark, mm. how much movement they have in their classrooms. You can see some. So we want to ask our viewers on uh, online to let us know how much movement is in their classroom. Yeah. So let's say if it's if it's ten percent, that means for every ten minutes that uh, students are sitting down, there's one minute where they're maybe moving around doing something else, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious let's to hear what what kind of responses we get. Yeah, let's give them a moment. I'm thinking for when I was a student, I think that I was in my desk a hundred percent of almost every class. Mm. It arrived, I, sat down I mean, at the beginning, and left at the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was always recess where we got to go outside and play. But while yeah. we were in the classroom, I mean, the good students were the ones that sat still and didn't, you know, get up and move around. That was being yeah. a good student. I'm thinking of high school and university, too. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't have recess in the high school or university. I, I wish that I had recess. Yeah. Well, we had breaks. <laughs> but... Uh, We're getting some some answers like ten uh, percent um, uh, from Nadina, Krasimira, Hussein, Marco, Antonio says fifty percent. That's a pretty active classroom. Go, so Marco, uh, Antonio. Jessica says ten percent. We're getting a range here. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what I would expect. Um, but now let's look at some of the the obstacles that teachers face. And here we have a teacher saying. Okay, I think you really need to have a look at my classroom because classrooms are different all over the world. Yeah. Well, so you think that teachers might say, yeah, movement's good, but my space, no, I don't think you can move in my space. Is that what teachers are, are saying, you think? That's what I think they're saying. I bet um, you have some pictures of classrooms to show us. I don't know. Let's skip ahead and see if we can find a picture of a classroom. Okay, here's one from uh, Africa. I'm not sure where, but I took it myself. And you can see those are very heavy desks. If you have 50 or 60 kids in that classroom, how can you move? Here's another one from, this is from Mozambique. And you can see it's a little bit more modern, but still, look at the physical space. This space exists for desks and chairs. You'd think the architect built it with desks and chairs in mind. They are the kings and queens of the classroom. But I think students are more important than desks and chairs. Mm -hmm. Lecturers will be familiar with something like this. You can see that on one end, it's totally closed off. That's a terrible space for getting any movement. There's another classroom of a sort of short rectangular space. So that's a little different. And then I think a lot of people might have something like this if you teach at a, a high school or university somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. That's an awful lot. Of interesting comments, Kevin. Oh, good. Um, Sadia Algamdi says, sometimes movement needs to be carefully managed or carefully arranged or there will be a big mess. <laughs> I, I like the way she phrased that. There definitely will be a big mess. And I think that we can manage movement. That's my point, mm -hmm. is that if we manage it, it can be a very useful tool. And it's not that difficult to manage it. Yeah. Uh, well, also, G Gabriela Lopez Garcia de Andrich writes, um, what I'm afraid of when movement in the classroom is involved is that students can miss what's important in the lesson. She says, I'm working with 40 students in a class, so having students move is a bit of a problem. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, they might miss information if it's a lecture and they're moving around, but if they have a project, if they have a task that is clearly outlined and with clear guidance and directions, then 
I think they'll be exploring knowledge rather than than just taking it in. Sure, sure. Well, and one last comment. Hussein Karam says, I'm not able to move. Oh, man, I don't know, the teacher can't move. I don't know. Because I have 70 students in each classroom. That would be packed. But I bet you there's more than 70 students in this uh, picture right here. There's at least 100, probably 150. Uh, now, it, of course, let's move on with the photos. It depends on what size. You might have 70 students in that room. Mm. Uh, and it's a large room. I could see how we could still use group work. Well, let's move ahead. Here's a classroom from India. I think there's some space in the middle. Here's another one that's more modern. So if you had 70 people in that room, could they move? I think most teachers are saying no. It would be a challenge. You could easily fit 70 students in this room. Do you think you could get any movement in there during an activity? Most definitely. You just have to be a little creative, right? I think so, yeah. And you have to have a good activity planned. It's not movement just for the sake of movement. We need an activity, right? No, so you're not just saying teachers should go, hey, students, move. <laughs> no, that that's, will be chaos. Unless be chaos. it's a quick break to get your blood flowing. <laughs> that's right, that's you right. Want to say, you have 30 seconds to move, then, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad idea. You're right, right. Um, here's what I've been thinking lately as we look at this next slide. Things have not changed much. This is from 1902 in the USA. That's, if I showed you a picture of a hospital in 1902 and a hospital today. <laughs> it would look very different. I, I suspect it would, but in education, no, we're very traditional. I like all the little boys wearing bow ties like me. It's nice. That is cool. Yeah. That is cool. Nice to know bow ties are still in style. Or are they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And they're very well behaved here, uh -huh. which is what people generally think of as a disciplined classroom. But I think we can have discipline with movement. The question is why? Why should we do a movable class? I'll give you five good reasons. Without the first one, I probably wouldn't do it but it's fun. There's a lot that you can do and your students will enjoy it and you will too once you are confident as a teacher. It also allows you to have more variety for your teacher toolkit. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, what do you mean by that? What is what okay. do you mean by variety? That if you are always working with arrangements of students in rows looking straight at you, you have a very limited amount of activities that you can do with students. You can lecture at them. You can hand out pieces of paper on which they write. But how are they going to explore, make project work, uh, arrange different groups? you're suddenly going to get a lot more variety. I find this very liberating. And group work is key. In fact, one of the main reasons to add more movement is just to create groups. If nothing else, just to create new groups. Because when you have a lot of group work, you have a more learner-centered class. And once you start doing these things, it all leads to better class management. Oh, hold on a second. Are you, are you telling our audience, Kevin, that with students moving around a lot, making noise, moving their bodies, you actually have better class management? I am saying that. I know it sounds weird. Uh, but when I started doing this, I had a lot of obstacles, that's for sure. But now I'm much better at managing a classroom. And I think the research bears this out, that you actually become better at guiding students and getting better discipline when you allow more variety and group work. But all those things aside, if there was one reason only 
for getting movement in the classroom, it would be enough. And it's this, it's student health. It's just not good for people to be sitting down all the time. Kevin, I thought we were language teachers, not doctors. Well, we're not doctors. Oh, thank goodness. And we don't need to wear a stethoscope to class. We don't need to introduce aerobics or swimming or volleyball in our lessons. However, some current research in the last 10, 15 years is showing us how bad sitting is, especially extended sitting. And that's what's happening in classrooms, right? We bring people into the classrooms, they sit all day long. If we look at this next slide, it's a sort of iconic image about the development of human beings. And there's actually about a two million year period where human beings, in the center there, where human beings were hunters and gatherers. And now you'll see this person on the right working on the computer. That's what we do for about 18 hours a day. We sit in cars, we sit at school, and we come home and we sit in front of our tablet or TV. Do we really sit that much, Kevin? We sit 18 hours a day? Uh, okay, no, I'm sorry, I didn't allow for sleep. Oh, okay. So if we sleep eight um, hours, you're left with 16. So uh, I'd say about 12 hours, uh, about 16 hours you could be standing or lying sorry sitting or lying down that is that is oh that is a lot of time sitting kevin it is especially when our bodies are designed through two million years of evolution to be moving and so we see a lot of health concerns from that sedentary life from sitting and not moving they even, they even call it sitting disease now wow and this very recent report that you can see says that there's a direct relationship between time spent sitting and your risk of early mortality. Now, please, please tell us what, what, is, what does that mean, early mortality, Kevin? That means dying earlier than you should. So the more you sit, the higher your risk of early mortality. That's what some studies are saying, that there is a correlation. The people who sit the most tended to have more health problems and die earlier. However, great news here, simple solution. Don't you love simple solutions in life? Uh, please, tell us what the simple solution is so that we can not have early mortality. <laughs> Those people that sat for 30 minutes and then got up and moved didn't have the high risks. So all you have to do really is break the sitting cycle, or as the American Heart Association says, sit less, move more. I love it. And also, let's look about it for, in terms of the brain too. Maria Montessori, whose name is probably familiar, has said that an essential factor of intellectual growth is movement. Hmm. So it's good for the brain. And on the subject of the brain, Dr. James Levine even goes as far as saying the brain is designed to think while moving. That's really interesting. You know, we heard from uh, one of our participants, Lady Benitez Betancourt writes, with movement, students feel more active and have more energy to complete their tasks. If they don't move, they become sedentary and lose interest in class. So it's the same idea, isn't it? It is, it is. I used to teach adult courses um, in the Republic of Moldova, actually. And students would come in after work, and of course they were adults and they were tired. And they just wanted to sit there. <laughs> and they said, no, we're not going to do anything else. But of course, once they started being active, they enjoyed it much more than they would just sitting there. Of course. Yeah. So here is a, a survey that's a compilation of research by the Centers for Disease Control, a governmental organization in the USA. 
specifically about physical activity and learning in schools. And here's what they came up with, some conclusions. One is that physical activity can improve academic achievement. Also that physical activity can impact cognitive skills, your thinking, concentration, and even positively impact classroom behavior. It's hard to believe, it sounds weird, makes sense to me I think you know when um, sometimes students have a lot of energy and they don't know how to let it out maybe they let it out by misbehaving sometimes yeah uh, as teachers we can design activities that have them getting their energy out in productive ways then obviously classroom well behavior said. is improved yeah that's well said getting their energy out in productive ways I think that's what we're really looking for and I know it's difficult, but for those of you out there who use movement or are deciding tonight, well, maybe I'll add a little movement. You are hero teachers because you're not part of the problem making students sit down against their will. You're allowing them to get up and use their bodies. We can learn a language while we're standing. We don't have to be sitting down all the time. Natalia Weisbach says, Kevin, movement yeah. helps them, uh, students to oxygenate their brain. We all know how important oxygen is. Yeah. I would That's, say it's pretty important. Yeah, it is pretty important. So it gets your blood moving. And I think people think better when they're moving. Mm. I know that when you're sitting, all sorts of sh shutdown behaviors happen physio physiologically with the body. So let's get practical right now and move ahead and find three super easy ways to make your class more movable right now, whether it's at kindergarten level or university level. And these three ways are, you can see on the screen, one is just adding quick breaks. The other, the second group, work and teamwork and then responding physically and these are all interrelated that's why i have those three uh circles there to show that they, they're kind of overlapping at times so the first one would be fast action breaks this is just a way of bringing a, a quick energizer icebreaker brain break into the classroom there are literally thousands of these. And I guess my main message is don't be afraid to bring one in. Even if you have um, English learners that are 50 years old, they might feel silly, but if you believe it, because you're a hero teacher, they will follow you. Well, I, speaking of silly, I would love to hear your idea about a dance break. <laughs> Well, there's so many famous dances, the twist, um, mm -hmm. the Harlem shuffle or something like that, <laughs> all, all sorts of things. And you could just play music for 10 minutes, uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, mm -hmm. one minute. There are also songs that are actually designed for movement. So in that way, you're following instructions. It's a listening task listening comprehension, as well as uh, an active break. One of them is a song well known and on our very own American English webinar, uh, sorry, American English website. And there's a, you can download the MP3 of it. And you'll see that the class will follow these movements. Let me show you how this goes on the old accordion here. It goes something like this. You put your right arm in, you take your right arm out. Put your right arm in and then you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey 
and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Wow. I um I think this is the first ever on Facebook Live. Uh, the hokey pokey by accordion for English teachers. I wonder if anyone in our audience has danced the hokey pokey before. I'm guessing that's that a, answer is going to be yes. That's a great question. And I, I would guarantee, I think one of the songs that's known around the world by English teachers is head, shoulders, knees, and toes as well, which comes from the same album on American English as, as the Hokey Pokey. Wait, you mean people can download this and use this for free from our website? Yeah, they can. We have a whole album of uh, Sing Out Loud children's songs. But Kevin, um, what uh, Cecia Sanchez uh, Salvatierra wants to know, do we have to do this every day? Um, do we have to? <laughs> no, not if it's not part of your teaching makeup. But I'm hoping that you'll be inspired to bring it in, even if it's by slow baby steps. Um, for some teachers, it takes a long time to bring these in. And I think, I think that if I'm a student, sitting for an hour or two in a classroom, I want to be able to get up at least once a lesson. Well, I think that in some parts of the world, like um, in Iraq, Hussein Karam says that dancing is forbidden in class. So I bet you have other ideas for movement aside from dancing. Sure. Don't dance then. If it's forbidden, definitely don't dance. Um, there, these are just five examples out of thousands, right? Stretch break. Oh, yes. Yeah, Next slide will show you what it's like to stretch. Mm -hmm. If the teacher gives the instructions in English, it's also a listening comprehension task. Or here's a new one. Students love their cell phones everywhere. So make a rule. Midway through class, they get three minutes. They can check their cell phone, but they have to go stand against the wall to do it so that they actually are standing up and we're breaking that deleterious sitting cycle. Or, now I don't know if this is forbidden in some places, it probably is, but often at the beginning of a classroom session, I will say sometime during the lesson, I'm going to pull out this noisemaker. <laughs> And when I do that, we're just going to laugh together. Sometimes it works and the whole class laughs and can't stop. Sometimes it doesn't work very well. But laughter is a form of movement. You can really feel it. Let's see if it works here, John Mark. All right. Here's laugh break. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, is there anyone out there in webinar land that laughing? Yeah, I bet you people are laughing out there. Let us know out there if you're laughing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> One participant just said we are crazy. Wow. Are, we, that you and I are crazy? Yeah. Wonderful. You That's like the best compliment crazy. ever. I know. I like that too. <laughs> I like that too. So that's a laugh break. Uh, what else can we do? Here's something rather practical for a break in the middle of the class. Roll call. Instead of taking students, writing a check mark near students' names on your roster, put five or six pieces of paper on the wall around the room. Students can get up midway through the room and sign any of those pieces of paper. And then you have an instant um, roll for the class for that day. You didn't do any work as a teacher. They got up and did movement. Apparently Vera Cruz is uh, laughing <laughs> along with Good. us. Thank you Vera Cruz. Okay, so there are millions of energizers. Just take a two-minute break in the middle of class and 
see if your class enjoys it. A super valuable way to add movement to the class is just adding more group work and teamwork. And if you do nothing but add group work and teamwork, your class is going to be more dynamic and more learner centered. Group and teamwork, we could get, we get physical action, just the physical movement of forming a new group. And we can also add a problem solving element. And in order to problem solve, the students will have to use English communication. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Forming a single line. In a way, that's solving a problem. Everyone has to work together to form a line. Now, one thing I love about forming a single line is it doesn't matter what kind of classroom you have. There's almost always room to form a line, even out in the corridor or along the side of the wall. And we can add a, a problem solving element as we do in this next slide called birthday calendar. So the teacher says, I want you to form a line according to the day of your birth, not the year, with January on one side and December on the other. This is good practice for months and days, but it's all, also the whole group has to work together and sort themselves into one line. I look, it would be I even pre-teach some English vocabulary for yeah. communicating. For example, you can pre-teach, you stand here, I'll stand there, or my birthday is before your birthday, or your birthday is before my birthday. And then they can yeah. use it in the activity. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great uh, suggestion, John Mark. Really good. And you can see how easy it would be to make groups once you have everybody in a line. You could say, okay, you first three, second three, last four, your groups. This way you randomize the groups so that friends aren't always with the same people. There's a million lines that you can do. The time it takes to get to school. Here's one. It goes from the shortest time to the longest time. It can be the number of siblings you have. You can arrange yourself by height, uh, by the number of coins you are holding in your pocket or purse. Yeah, let's hear from our viewers um, some other ideas. Remember we had a yeah. really great one this morning great idea. on uh, what the, how many letters are in your name, right? Long name, short name. But let's hear what people uh, watching have uh, ideas. Good idea. Oh, do people like spiders? Who likes spiders, really, Kevin? You like spiders? Hmm. I mean, I don't like them. Like, I don't pet them. I don't pet them either. <laughs> no. Um, but I do. I don't hurt them if they live in my house. Hmm. And they do. Okay, that's fair. But you know, it could be how much you. This is a, a quantitative judgment. So now we've moved on to rock music, which is fine. So it's like, how much you do you really, really love rock music? Hmm. How do you feel about rock music, John Mark King? I feel like I could not live without it. So I would definitely be on the, the left. I would be at the far left in this line. I'd be there right with you. So you and I would have a quick conversation on like, who loves it the most? <laughs> right. Uh, we've, so we've heard from our audience, um, uh, oh, ranging by shoe size uh -huh. and um, uh, uh, height, uh, but also from Tatiana, how many sweets you can eat at one time. That sounds wow. dangerous. I also saw how many sodas you drink in one day. Yikes. Or how many sodas you can drink in like five minutes. Making me yeah. a contest out of it. I don't know who really likes soda. Yeah. And so the it's a, there's an infinite number of uh, of line criterion you could make. Um, I put accordion music in there just because I like it. I don't think most people are going to form to to feel very strongly about that one. So, but the message is 
make it personal. Make it something that matters to you and your students. Now, imagine that your classroom has four corners, because probably 99% of the classrooms in the world have four corners. Ooh, you see, Jessica had an idea for a line. How many tacos do you eat in one day? Wow. Tacos Not as many good. as I'd like. Yeah. So here we have corners, and we can identify each corner, give them a number, one, two, three, or four, or use the compass, the points of the compass to designate the north, east, south, or west corner. And then we can give students four choices. And there, for example, what's your favorite season and why? Now bodily, the students are going to actually move to the corner that they like best. And then they have about 30 seconds to talk with the people there. There's no reason to make an activity like this go on for a long time. As soon as people lose interest, just change it up. Do you have a favorite season, John Mark? Where would uh, you? Yes, my favorite season is fall or autumn. Really? Mm. Why? I, I love the way that the, the air feels in autumn. The air has like a very crisp feel, the smell of the leaves changing. How about you? That's exactly what I think. There's something about the air. Uh, a student in Russia once described it to me as smooth. And I Ooh, love that. Nice. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I love autumn too. I think that but also, we, Kevin, if, if teachers wanted to, instead of randomly picking the topic for the four corners, couldn't the topics be related to whatever the students are exploring in, the, in that unit or on the syllabus? Yeah, that would be a great way to bring some movement into activities or topics that you are required to cover. Yeah, that would be a great thing. So let's say if you're doing a reading lesson, you pick four characters. Who, which is your favorite character and why? Right? Yeah. If you read a story, great example, John Mark. Great example. That keeps us on the syllabus. I like that. And once students understand how this works, you can say, now it's your turn. You know, get in a little group and give us, make some four corners activities that we can try. Here's another one for those of you like me who are hungry right now. <laughs> it's what would you eat right now? And you'll notice that they, we have a generic sandwich, a pizza. So when you go to that corner, if you want a sandwich, you're going to tell your classmates what you want on the sandwich or what you want in your salad or what you want your dessert to be. Again, take about one minute to do that activity, maybe two. As soon as it's slow, move on to another one. Well, and so um, Abdel Hadi Ali wants to know what the students are going to do in their four corners. But to this activity, you're saying, you know, if you like pizza, go to the pizza corner. But once you get there, share what toppings you want on your pizza. That's what they do in their corner, right? Yeah. And uh-huh. Or in the dessert corner, what kind of dessert would you like? Now, that's a great question, because if you're working with lower level learners, they might go to the corner and just not feel confident to say anything. At which case, you could give them uh, models like you were suggesting before. On my pizza, I want, you could even write this on the board. Mm -hmm. Or if no one's talking, just move on. You mean it's okay if an activity kind of fails? That's okay? I think so. I think we, we don't force it ahead. As soon as people start talking, we just move on. We make it interesting by finding another topic. Yeah, I don't think that's a failure. Great point. So, now 
um, let's look at some jobs. Again, we're doing the same activity. We just thought, which of these jobs would be best for you? And then you have 30 seconds, one minute to decide why. And then the teacher can say, now move, which job would be worse for you? Mm. So again, moving very quickly, ac these activities don't have to be long. Short and sweet. Now let's move to number three. I told you there were three ways that we could bring easy movement activities into the classroom. Nope, we're still on forming groups. <laughs> Here's a great way to uh, form groups. One of the easiest ways you can form groups in your classroom. Teacher, you can just say, hey, groups of four. Everyone stands up and they go form a group of four. It doesn't matter who you're with. They don't know that that's going to be the group they're working with yet because you can go now form groups of seven and they move to form groups of seven. If someone doesn't fit, that's okay because you'll just do another number. Now form groups of three. Put your hand up when you're finished like that. I'd love to hear from our participants their ideas for forming groups um, or corners or forming lines and topics. Um, please put them in the chat. If we don't have time to get to them today, we'll sure be, I'm sure that others are going to learn from your ideas. But please share your ideas. And Kevin and I want to see them too. Yeah, absolutely. I will be looking at the comments for sure. Okay. So the, the last thing that we can do, and this is this works for big lecture halls, is respond bodily. And what I mean by that is that normally when we're in a classroom, the teacher stands in front and asks the class a question. It can be something like, who likes chocolate here? Or uh, who, who do you think is the most likable character in 19 in Animal Farm? <laughs> um, and what do students do then? They go like this, right? They raise their hand and the teacher generally chooses one person to answer. Or let's try a very simple class question like, is coffee good for you? Everyone has an opinion, maybe. Um, but the teacher calls on one person, maybe two. We can phrase this so that everybody has to answer. For example, is coffee good for you? Stand up if you agree. So people that remain sitting are no, people that stand up are yes. But we can change this. We can have everybody standing up by giving them a cue card. Let's say um, the happiest day of your life is the day you get married. Now, everyone stands up. Do you agree or disagree? Mm. We so can even in the sign so that everybody stands up, not just the yeses. Yeah. Right. So no matter who you are, you stand up, but you have to hold your yes or no sign. Yeah. And 100% of the students are participating and the teacher can tell what everyone thinks. It doesn't have to be a real sign. It can be a little piece of paper that the student writes himself, right? Make the students do the work, teachers. We can actually add a further element because life isn't always yes or no or agree, disagree. Sometimes there's a middle ground. That's why I have this mysterious yellow sign for students that think, oh, maybe, or I'm not sure. I can give them an, another possibility for expression. Hmm. So there's all sorts of things. Yes can be wave your arms. Yes can be cross your arms when you're standing up. We, we can do all sorts of symbols to respond. So you could say wave your arms for yes and cross your arms for no. Yeah. Or you can say do this for sometimes, do this for never. You know, we can expand the way that the whole class answers the question. 
All right, so we've looked at three super easy ways to get action into your classroom. And the next step, okay, start with those easy steps. See if you like it. If there's a lot of chaos, then try it again. When you go further with the movable class, the next step beyond this for the professionals is to think of your favorite activity. Maybe people in the audience will can write in, what is the thing that you love to do most? Is it reading aloud? Is it dictation? Is it um, doing exercises in the textbook? Is it role play? Because the next step is to think of how you can make your favorite activity. Well, so you have to explain what's going on in this picture here, Kevin. This is very interesting. Okay, I will. So this is at a camp, and we were doing a dictation, right, where I would say a vocabulary word, and the girls would write that word down. But why should you be sitting at your desk to do that? It's not a problem to do it at your desk, but certainly it's not really a problem to do it standing up, writing on the back of the person in front of you. Hmm. They were doing the same task, but they were having more fun, I think. So they're writing as if they were right, like the same thing they would be writing as if they were at their desk, but instead they're walking around the class and writing on a classmate's back. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Yeah, it, it was fun. It's not something I'm going to do every time, but, you know, it's, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm hoping now that we've looked, um, we've talked about some movement activities. I'm hoping that some people are starting to, hmm, maybe I can start thinking more movable. But some of you still might be uh, having some hesitations. You might think, yeah, it's fine for you, Kevin, but in my class, it's impossible. Why? Because my class looks like this. Now, John Mark, when you see that picture, can you see any possibilities for movement in that classroom? I do. You know, there are a lot of people there, but it, the great thing is it's a really big room. It is. And Good. so you can actually move a lot in that classroom, I think. Yeah, you're thinking movable. You're, think, you, you're thinking of the sign. Uh, you also noticed earlier that it's a sunny day there. Yeah, go outside. Yeah. So here's what I see when I enter a class like this. I immediately start scanning it. Uh, I wonder if there's any room in back. I see that those, there's two long aisles. I could easily make partner lines, two parallel lines there. I wonder if the desks can be picked up and moved. So there are possibilities for almost every room. Let's look ahead now. If the weather's nice, take people outside. This is a standing partner line. So these two, pe two lines where everyone has one partner. And then we switch partners every two minutes by rotating one line. Or John, Mark, and I, you and I often end up in, in hotels and conference rooms doing presentations. Yes, this is very familiar, this room is. Yeah, this is a setup that I really don't like at all. <laughs> if you have PowerPoint, it's fine, but uh, uh, what did you notice here? Any potential for movement? I think so. Well, I definitely see there's room for lines because the aisles are very long and there's plenty of walking space there. And I also see a door in the back and there's another door on the side. I wonder where those doors go if there's more space out there. I'll tell you where they go. Hmm. They go to a place where you can move the tables. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll see here that I just moved all the tables out or, or most of them. I kept a few because it's good to have things a surface to write on, but we made it into a kind of dance floor so we could do a lot more uh, motion activities. Here's a brave teacher in Tanzania, a big classroom, not afraid to have group work. Students are actually even using the floor. 
I think that's cool. In the next slide, another brave teacher. All these chairs were filling up the room. He told students, stack them up in the middle. Now we're going to do a cool mingle activity. Isn't that great? I love it. That's great. Another great tip. Often it's the things we bring into the room that fill it up so that we can't move. One teacher asked students to keep their bags outside so the, the room is not as cluttered. So the way I think of it is as a teacher, you're kind of an artist, at least you're a professional and the classroom is your place. It's your stage, your office, your studio. So try not to let people tell you what to do with it. <laughs> So let's review. Remember that those conclusions from the Centers for Disease Control. They say physical activity improves academic achievement, including test scores. It positively impacts thinking skills, focus, classroom behavior. Now, is that really possible? Apparently it is. Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control, yeah. So let's review the five things, five reasons, or six reasons that I think it's great to add more movement to the class. There they are to look at them. Fun, variety. Oh, fun. Sorry, let's go back to that picture. Fun. Look that at these. Like adult. Fun to me. And they are having a great time. And they're adults. Uh, variety. Increase your teaching tool book with variety. Look at these teachers in Yemen. Oops. I don't know what they're doing, but I don't want to do that activity. <laughs> it, it's, it looks yeah, it's fascinating. Fun. Yeah, it's better than sitting at a desk, I can tell you that. Uh, let's look at group work. Here we have access students in Zimbabwe playing a board game. They've been grouped together. Some are sitting, some are standing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's, when we get more group work, we get a learner-centered class. Look at this library in Ukraine. 40 students there. I counted them. They're all facing each other because the interaction is going to be Student to student, it's not all teacher to student. And that's not a big space. They're not standing up, but they're going to be moving to create new pairs all the time. Next, here's this lecture hall. You probably run into these sometimes. I just love to use those aisles in the middle or the sides between them to get people standing and talking to each other. And finally, when you start using all this group work and randomizing groups, we get better class management because you learn to make people move efficiently and to end tasks efficiently. Check this out. This is Ukraine. We had 120 people, some usually about 100, but we still did pair work. Wow, at 120 the, uh, students in one class? Yeah, well, we had to use two rooms mm -hmm. <laughs> um, very often, and the great team at America House that led this, but they still had pair work. It really helped to have a timer so that everyone knew when to change pairs. But better class management once you start getting good with group work. And then the next slide, I just... I call standing triangles. All the teachers get up and form groups of three standing up. So, so many reasons to use that movement, but let's go back to the main one. If there's no other reason, please do it once a class, just for your students' help, health. Break that sitting cycle. Kevin Abir Ali writes, I hope that this presentation will help me make a change in teaching English in my large classes. Thanks. Isn't that wonderful? That is so cool. 
you made my night. And, <laughs> you know, sometimes it doesn't work smoothly the first time. I've had a lot of things go badly, make a lot of noise and chaos, but it doesn't mean that the students aren't doing the task. Great. So that is a brave teacher. I think being brave is such an important message for teachers. And I admire teachers like, was it Amir? So how do we sum this up? Wow, is it moving around is good for learning and good for health and good for student behavior? That's incredible. Yeah. And if you act right now, you will also get <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So keep it moving, everybody. You can see that I like moving. Great. I appreciate everyone attending today.